Let's look at some of the medieval knightly pole arms as featured in Fiori's Treaties with my guest Matt Lewis. <laughs> Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiator, and I've got a very special guest, Matt Lewis. Now, we have both been, and are to some extent still currently, students of Fiore Delibery's works. He wrote uh, a number of treatises, of which four survive, um, and they've been very important to us and our understanding and study of medieval weapons. Now, this isn't a dedicated Fiore video, but we're using him as a springboard to look at some specific examples of knightly pole arms, very nice ones, from um, all from Matt's collection. Um, so you wouldn't normally see them on this channel, but Matt's very kindly brought them down. So maybe we should start with the one that he's holding, which in some ways, although there's some peculiarities to this one, in some ways is one of the most basic and standard uh, pole arms of all history, isn't it? Well, it's, the king, it's the king of weapons. The ki it? king of weapons, aka the spear, the spear, or as Fury would have called it, the lan lanza. lanza, lancha. lanza um, yeah. So lance, okay, so in English we often make a differentiation between the words lance and spear. We often refer to lance on horseback, spear on foot. Funnily enough, actually if you look at medieval English sources you'll often find the mounted lance is referred to sometimes as a spear and um, uh, the, the word lance can be applied to any type of spear. Uh, fundamentally one is a French origin word one is a English Anglo-Saxon origin word and as is often with the English language that will come down to like the difference between cow and beef it will come down to the which is Norman and which is Anglo-Saxon but anyway so the spear super super important and it is important in Fury. he doesn't have a very big spear section he only really has a couple of techniques in there it's the thing with the spear is it's it's always been around mm. well, since the Bronze Age probably since before sharpened sticks it's like it's the original weapon for lots of reasons that we don't really need to get into here but Mm. and it exists right the way through and okay Fiori doesn't get into it a lot but it's there and it's in other treaties and it's in gladiatoria and it's 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 still yeah it's, it's a fundamental weapon to knights and the spear is so good at so many things it is pretty good in single combat it is really good in massed combat it is good against horses it is pretty good in armor uh, it, on a horse it's yeah it's just a jack of all trades it does everything pretty well um, about the only thing it doesn't do well is fight in small spaces confined spaces but that's what knives and daggers are for um, so yeah it's a, it's a fantastic weapon however in this era you have to bear in mind that unlike say for example in the Frankish or Anglo-Saxon era people in this era are wearing a lot more armor aren't they and so the spear had to deal with armor and obviously there are other specialized weapons which we're going to look at here uh, for fighting against or in armor um, how was this one optimized for fighting in armor yeah so this again this is just like a foot lance and it is quite different to what you'd be familiar with from uh, like a lance lance which you mm. use on horseback mm. um, and it has this is somewhat optimized for fighting in armor if you know what to look for um, specifically the head like the, the head is, doesn't, is really just a spike delivery mechanism, much like many of the things in the period that are designed uh, to deliver armor. But uh, a common feature of these these reinforced tips, yeah, which shall we? I'm struggling to show you. Yeah, if I try and <laughs> hold that, so some of these might be quite difficult to get on camera. Let's see, let's do it like that. That way, there we go. So you can see that tip is not; it doesn't just taper down to a point, but it has a thick reinforced point somewhat similar to certain types of arrowhead rondel so, even yeah rondel daggers like certain types of sword have heads like that um even if we go back to the roman era there are types of roman gladius with points like that aren't there yeah i think so this i mean it's got a longer shank on this i mean mm. i don't know if that's anything obviously langits exist to protect your shaft and i suspect that to some degree that this is to make it just a little bit harder to start lopping bits off at, at range and also to give you more stability i think so i mean you know the use of spears or any types of pole arms in in armored fighting plate armored fighting i think they're used more as levers uh, than perhaps they were in earlier periods so i think possibly i mean i've noticed looking at the size of spear sockets and shafts when they survive although obviously they don't often survive we often see that shafts on pole arms get quite thick in this period and i suspect that's partly because of the armored context and partly because they're now being used as almost like paddles rather than just stab stab yeah, stab they're dealing with a lot more strain so when you look at like earlier spears stuff from like from the migration period typically they're quite slim shafts because the mm. whole 
you tend to be using it with one hand. And that's a very important point as well. And this is a two-handed yeah, weapon, really. When you're using a spear one hand, they're, they're trying to weight save as much as they possibly can to mm. make it you know, usable for any length of time, whereas that's gone out the window with this. This spear is a two-handed spear yeah. for use on foot. So it can be a bit heavier, it can be a bit thicker. It's, you know, you've got quite an overbuilt shaft on this, really. It's just mm. a strong shaft. Um, and the other thing you kind of get with it, which is quite common <laughs> on nightly uh, foot weapons, is... A, a back end. A back end. A shoe. A, shoe. a pedale. Yeah, so, so essentially... It's funny, isn't it? Because you want to have something that is offensive, but also remember a lot of time that will get jammed in the ground uh, when you're carrying a spear around because anyone who's carried a spear around for any amount of time, which if you do any kind of reenactment or stuff like that, pole arms, you often want to just stand them on the ground. So you don't necessarily want something which is easily going to get damaged. It needs to be quite, quite fat. Um, but that's still going to be very nasty to have yeah, jabbed into you, isn't it? It does get used. It does get employed, especially when you've got something long. If and you, it's a counter in yeah, Fiore, you know. Around your point. Yeah. You can immediately resort to and the back end. I recently showed a video showing exactly this, where this is one of the, if the swordsman crosses your point and closes in, you spin the back end around. It's just one classic option. Um, so having a point on both ends, and not to say that all spears at this time have points they on both ends, um, but this is what Fiori would incidentally call a short lance or short um, spear. They did come in various lengths. And I, my opinion, looking at medieval art, is this is a sort of knight's length of spear. So this is kind of like a single combat, a hero's spear. Whereas your rank and file would have something not pike length, but, but longer, maybe, you know, 10 or 12 foot long, because they're going to be the ones holding off cavalry, fighting with other units of polemen. Uh, and the armor. extra length obviously compensates for you not wearing as much protection yeah. as well. You Peeps and further away. Whereas this is more a weapon that you might be wading into enemy ranks or fighting with enemy knights up close with, using the shaft to push away, using both ends, using it a bit more like and a pole axe. In which case, too much length is actually disadvantageous, disadvantageous yeah. yeah worse in single combat so it's a it's a kind of i always make a big thing about how reach and length is a, an advantage in single combat but there is a point at which it can become a disadvantage yeah. and certainly the different uh, specific contexts in a melee in an armored fight inside a building where obviously an overly long weapon is a big yeah, disadvantage and this one is, you know it's it, it's obviously optimized for foot combat yeah. in armour and uh, you see them they pop up in all the manuscripts even even though they tend to be quite short periods you'll find mm. other references to the mm. spear and they tend to be of that shorter length and, and carry things I think you've got this other tip here which I think is probably a little more typical of a uh, slightly earlier period perhaps but probably still, yeah. still kicking around at the time but so it's also got a fairly reinforced tip um, and it's got a strong midrib. I've talked about this um, head on camera before. It, it, it's somewhat similar to a rondel dagger in that it's set up for penetrating resisting it's targets, though, isn't, isn't it? it? Really yeah, it's, it's a slightly different design, but the same and funnily enough made by the same maker. Is it turns oh, yeah, out yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, yeah um, Damien, Damien Solovsky. Yeah, 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 that's right. So, um, so yeah, so essentially this is a in a sense, a typical short knight's spear of the 15th century, but it's specialised for armoured fighting. It's a robust shaft, it's a robust socket, it's got a reinforced point, and it has a point on the back end. What we'll look at now is an even more specialised, or should we say evolved, type of spear. I mean, it is and it isn't, because this is oddly familiar to anyone that studies, um, well, yeah. Viking Age and even like some late migration. Even earlier, stuff. yeah. I think you've got one, haven't you? I have. If you can grab, I'll hold this one, if you grab that one. I get the nice one, then. <laughs> um, so this is a sort of um, Frankish era, you could say 8th, 9th century version. And actually, it's a similar solution, isn't it? It's a cut and thrust spearhead now. So notice you've got a longer edge of blade that you potentially could cut with in various ways. You could perhaps chop. It's quite difficult to get the edge alignment. Uh, but you could certainly push and draw cut. Uh, with this, so you can use it a little bit like a glaive, but additionally, you've got these projecting wings or lugs. So you'll notice on the earlier one, the lugs are blunt, aren't they? But mm -hmm. these are very much not blunt. No, that's very blunt, no. <laughs> um, so these are pointed and edged on the inside. Sort of. They kind of mm. they, they're sharp towards a point. They get progressively blunter into thing. Okay. It's it's for hooking. It's a threat to mail, you know, and you can use it for 
I don't know, you could smack that into somebody's um, bend tail and maybe achieve something or pull it off, but it's mainly for hooking manipulation. You get that behind someone's knee and pull them off balance or behind their head and pull them over. Yeah. And I, I think the intention with these are, um, you know, you know, like you use uh, the cross guard on a sword to redirect things and catch things. Or something. Mm. It gives your spear some utility, especially on a two-handed spear, mm. which I think these were actually at the time, which is one of the reasons these were added. Mm. Um, and yeah, this just gives it a lot more utility and gives you a lot more options, which is like a lot of these specialised armoured weapons are all about getting more utility, getting more ways of threatening your opponent or manipulating your mm. opponent. Um, and this has the same kind of reinforced tip as the other one, but obviously it's mm. given over or compromised a little more to, to gain some cutting. I've tried cutting with it. It's not that easy to get the cutting section of that onto a specific target. Yeah. And you certainly wouldn't be using that, that element of it on an armoured opponent. I'm not really sh sure why you would bother, but I suspect it's just in case there's some peasants on the battlefield that need chopping yeah. up, then you, you can switch to that. But... Um, like with the other other thing, this, this also has a, a heel, a pedale on it, doesn't it? Yeah. And also, just before we turn it to the other end, it's also got langettes. And these are another good um, example of an adaptation, um, modification that was added from really from the 15th century, or we could perhaps say the late 14th century onwards, we often find pole arms of all sorts start to get these langets on here, and they serve a couple of purposes. Obviously, they protect a greater length of the wooden shaft from being hacked at by swords or axes, but additionally, they also give a greater surface area of attachment point for the head, which is particularly important when you've got something that's quite long and got a lot of leverage. So if you are whacking someone with this, if it was just a simple short socket, that's a lot of lateral stress potentially breaking it, it the shaft. It does indicate that it's not specifically just for thrusting because mm. it, it's anticipating more yeah. Functional stress is in, than, in, than you'd normally uh, And expect. these, of course, can act like a point on a warhammer or could be used for pulling and hooking either on an opponent's armour or legs or uh, horse, yeah. hot parts of a horse. Yeah, pull, pull on the quarter. Just, pull a rider off a, it's off a saddle. It's just a utility item. But yeah. you can also, like I said to you, I don't know, you can catch a spear on that and turn it off and use it <clears> much <throat> like you would a guard on a longsword yeah. in some way. Uh, incidentally, in, in period, uh, the, so Fiori called this a gear verina. Uh, if we look at Florio's Italian English dictionary of 1611 he tr actually has the word giverina in there and he translates it as spontoon <laughs> uh, <laughs> now a spontoon is a type of half pike that was carried by sergeants uh, in England with a cross piece but essentially it's a spear with a cross piece I've so I've got the uh, the other unfortunate name is the bohemian ear spoon yeah the bohemian ear spoon and I have <laughs> no idea where that comes from at all so I think in modern English we could call this a spontoon I think most people would call it a winged spear or a partisan it's of Full it's, of a it's a proto-partisan. I'm, I'm fairly certain this is what, you, what will then sort of develop into the partisan. Manchiolino sure. uses the word spiedo as well, which I think this might possibly qualify as a spiedo, or it might be partigiano, which is another word they use in Italian. But anyway, Fiori calls it a ghiavrina, which is a pretty interesting word. And then as... Um, you mentioned Jesus. That is. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy to turn no, well, that. This is why that is a heck of a spike on there. With let's just bring that up to the camera. I had to make all the covers for this because it likes to attach itself to the car, walls, <laughs> people, kittens, and if like anything around, it just likes to stick into. So that is a, a a shoe, a foot, but that is a full-on spike like you'd find on the top of yeah, a pole axe. Hollow, hollow, hollow ground, ground triangular. Uh, triangular. Yeah. Um, the other interesting, we had sort of a a stop put on here partially because you strike with that and it's just okay. a little mass in yeah. there but um i can now feel where, where you, my hand is yeah. on the end of that i don't now need to see it's a bit like a pommel I'm not, or i'm a, not just going to slide yeah. off down the end i've actually got this tactile it's the same with the the hexagonal shaft on here it's actually to help mm. you feel where mm. the edge is it's also worth mentioning as well in Fiori's treaties this gear verena is specifically shown as an anti-cavalry weapon so he's against people who are attacking him on horseback um, and he shows how you can knock the incoming lance off to the side and then use the back end so he very specifically uses the back end yeah, yeah. so this is a this is a spear that's not just kept point forward it's supposed to be turned around and revolved like a polax would be um, so again hence the slightly short well shorter length it's still quite yeah, long but yeah. in terms of pole weapons it's actually quite short yeah 
But I just do think it's interesting that Fiore shows this specifically against the cavalry. The other thing he says about this, I think he says it's very quick. And this mm. is... Yeah, it's, it's quicker more, than a poleaxe. It's, it's lighter and more nimble than a poleaxe. I mean, it's light enough that you could actually throw it, couldn't you? It yeah. wouldn't go very far, but you could throw it. I think it. the total weight on this is a little over five pounds, which is... For a polearm, it's, 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 it's light. It's very light and nimble, really. Anyway, that's lovely. So, basically, a kind of evolution of the spear, but ironically, not something that really first appears in the 15th century, because there are earlier versions of it, winged spears, that appear in the 8th, 9th century, I yeah, think? Yeah, maybe the... even earlier. I yeah. think if and again, this is only something I started digging into recently, like uh, migration period and vendal period spears and things like that, but there's certainly lugged and winged or, or permutations there of definitely the 8th century. I could probably find some stuff from Norway, I think. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's not a new idea. No, and no. It and it obviously worked because it's an idea that keeps coming back again and again over time. And very often with uh, so-called Dark Age or migration era weapons, we don't have any written sources to go on and there's so much guesswork. So the fact that we've got a very similar weapon in the 15th century is really nice because it, it means that we can maybe, with a bit more of an informed position, guess why and how that type of spear existed in earlier periods and how it was used, why it came about, you know, why did they invent the winged spear then? Maybe it was being an, used as an anti-cavalry weapon. Maybe, as you say, it was a dedicated two-handed there's, spear. There's some difference. Obviously, you can see some optimizations in that for the context of 15th century armoured combat. Yeah. It, but it's still kind of riffing on that original idea. Yeah. I, I suspect that they... M my guess is that that was a two-handed use spear. Obviously, that's a bit more optimised well, for fleshy people. Yeah, it's, um, it's a funny thing because the cross piece, if you, if you didn't have any evidence to go on whatsoever, you'd think the cross piece makes a lot more sense when you're using the spear two-handed because it gives you something to essentially parry and control yeah, with. because you don't have a shield. Because you don't have a shield. Although, funnily enough, there is Frankish art which shows spears with cross pieces being used one-handed with shields. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> so I can send you some links if that's well, useful. Well, maybe it's for use in one or two hands. Yeah. Maybe yeah. You know, when you shield and then because you can obviously use those lugs to pull someone's shield down That's and shove them in the face or push the shield. I've always wondered why those lugs are not pointed if they're offensive. So th them being used more like a hook actually makes a certain yeah, amount of I sense, think I think. For hooking and parrying and redirecting, I it just makes your spear suddenly a lot more useful than just a yeah. straight shaft with a tip on it. Yeah. It's a theory. Yeah. So the final pole arm we're going to look at from Fury's treaties, and of course one of the quintessential knightly pole arms, is the poleaxe. But it's not this poleaxe, because this is my poleaxe. This is also a poleaxe, even though it's not an axe. <laughs> Let's, yeah. let's unpack that Shall for a second. A so the yeah. first thing to say is that medieval sources refer to both of these as poleaxe, or Fury would call them both Adja, or Adza. He actually writes it with yeah. double Adza, Z. Adza, axe. Um, and these are all considered, they're considered the same weapon regardless of whether they have a hammer and a spike or whether they have a different type of hammer and an axe or whether they have an axe and a spike. And these are the, these are the typical combinations. But the common fact is that these are weapons usually that reach from either at minimum height, usually about your uh, kind of belly, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And at maximum height, you sometimes see them above head height with the, with the head or, um, yeah, the head of the weapon, even above, slightly above the head. But they're not as long as a typical halberd or a bill would be, which are usually more like 10 feet long. These are at maximum, usually about seven feet long, that kind of length. That's a very okay. real maximum. But yeah, so about five, about five to five, seven feet, but feet, yeah. usually they're roughly the same height, a bit shorter, a bit taller of the person using them. Therefore, one of the big differences of these are these are close in weapons to be used predominantly, if not entirely, predominantly by armoured people against other armoured people, but they are very good in the press, up close, they're manoeuvrable, you can turn them around easily, both ends are used liberally, so very often the back end will have stuff done with it um, before, the, before the top end would, would come around to strike. So they're very versatile and relatively nimble weapons and not particularly heavy. They're not as heavy as you might think. Um, and this type is very often lighter than this type. So I actually, not that long ago, I went through a bunch of the uh, Metropolitan Museum's collection of poleaxes looking at the weights of them to find out how accurate this replica I own it was. As it turns out, it's pretty much average weight for, for the surviving ones. But interestingly, the ones they have which don't have an axe blade, which have a hammer, 
and a point and a beak are lighter in general. They're usually about a pound lighter, I think, wow, um, than, okay. than these. So um, Yeah, so that brings me to like point one and Matt's list of pet peeves about yeah. pole axes. It's not a pole axe. Even though, if you're, in fairness, if you're searching online, write pole axe because it'll often get it's you the results you want. It's such a common error that yeah. you will still find. But it's a modern world error. It is a modern thing. So it's not a pole axe, it's a pole. 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 Double L. P-O-L-L. -L. For head. Yes. And the, now, why it's called a pole axe instead of a pole axe, we don't know exactly. And it's only the English as well that mm. call it that. Everyone else, it's just an axe. Yeah, so the yeah. French, so le jus de la hache, hache just means axe, it gives us the word hatchet. Incidentally, hatchet means small hash. Um, but hash just means axe and they just call it the hash. The Italians call it uh, the adza or accia. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, uh, oh, the, Germans, the, the Germans call it a murder axe, I think. Some time, maybe. Um, yeah. But um, like polling, polling. Right. Head count head. It's, yes. it's just an English for a head axe. Right? So if you yeah. ever chop the top off a tree uh, to bring its height down, and then it grows new shoots afterwards, and you can sometimes then harvest those shoots for arrows or various other things. That's called pollarding. Okay, so it means heading. A pole tax, like you say, it's a count of it's heads. It's a count of heads. Yeah. So pole means head. Now the question is, why is this called a pole axe? Is it a headsman's axe? Is it a it, because it's got something? It's got a head on it. Or, I have a pet theory. Uh, have I told you my pet theory? I think theory? you have, and I think it's the same as my pet theory. So I think uh, th it's because they are developed from the instrument used for killing cows. I think it's exactly that. So it's for bashing cows in the head. Um, and we see this in a various medieval art, where a cow, traditionally, when you come to, um, you know, you've, you've fattened it up and it's ready for the slaughter, they used to tie the uh, a rope around the cow's neck and to some pegs on the ground. So they pull it down to the ground and then you see the farmer with the axe, which has a hammer on the back end, smashes the uh, cow in the head with the hammer and then they butcher it and carve it up with the axe. So, so I suppose it's a bit of that traditional British dark humour really, isn't it? <laughs> your, your opponent is a, a dull cow to be smacked in the head. To be poleaxed. Pole and, and, yeah. Yeah, and we've still got this expression, to be poleaxed means to be knocked yeah. down, knocked senseless. Maybe finish him off with the arse dagger. Yeah. <laughs> so my working theory is, I have once seen an archaeologically found, and I wish I had it recorded, but I don't, but it was actually on an archaeological site, an early poleaxe dated to the 13th century. It didn't have a top spike, but it had an axe and a back hammer, and it was fairly large. So my working theory is, in the age of plate armour, when they were fumbling around trying to find better weapons for hurting each other with, new types of mace, new types of axe, and so on and so forth, new types of sword, that they repurposed pole axes for killing cattle into weapons of war, I mean, and sense. they were just known as pole axes. The, the, uh, the bill... Mm. started as an agricultural weapon. Yeah. There's a lot of weapons that are actually repurposed There's types tools, of scythe, yeah. there's flails, yeah. there's... I mean, axes, fundamentally, axes are tools that, that just so happen to work great as weapons. Maybe just one day someone picked up a slaughterman's I think so. axe and took yeah. it to someone in armour and found that it worked really well. On someone in armour, yeah, um, yeah, because yeah. it's a powerful, hard thing. Anyway, that's a, that's a sort of uh, tangent, but that's my current working theory, and I have very little evidence to back it up, but I'm probably right. <laughs> if you disagree... There's a logic to it. Yeah. Um, so, so, pet peeve number two. Okay. This is not a crow's beak. <laughs> right. Or a bec de corban. Yes. Modernisms, anachronisms, BS. <laughs> it, it, I mean, at, at a stretch, you can... You, well, it's not a stretch. You can call it a bec de falcon, because yeah. it exists in the jeu de hatch. And that's exactly how it's, it's called described. a beak, isn't it? Is it? Called a, beak, a beak, but not specifically a crow's no, beak. No, it's not a crow's beak. Yeah, and it's also, <laughs> I mean, you may disagree, but my, I personally do not think this is an offence. Uh, uh, it's not for penetrating armour. What this is, it's much like some of the other utility things. It's a big hook. It's for hooking your opponent behind the head, behind the knees, getting it into the gaps in their armour, pulling off a kilter if you get lucky. Um, and it allows you to manipulate your opponent. It's a very useful utility <laughs> item. There's an interesting detail in Le Jus de la Hache, and I think in Anonimo Bolognese as well, uh, where sometimes they specifically say to hook a part of the opponent or their armour with that, and sometimes they say to do it with that. There's also another interesting detail in Le Jus de la Hache. They refer to the hammer 
and the beak. So we know that Le Duc de la Hache is using one like this. It, they don't Not refer, like they don't, despite the fact it's called Le Jus de la Hache uh, axe, they don't actually refer to you the axe blade as far as I recall. You something to hook with, even <clears throat> that, you could get that yeah. behind someone's leg and pull them over. And so the French call this the dag or dagger. Uh, this is the beck. This is, I think, the marteau, the hammer. Um, and this collectively is called the cross. Okay, like a crucifix. And this is sometimes used to catch an opponent's weapon, sometimes to push an opponent's weapon, and sometimes to plant into someone's armpit and push the whole person away. Um, so all parts of this have had technical names um, and were used for, for different things. So they are, um, they're super, super specialized for armor combat, aren't they? Like everything, so everything in this is... I, yes, I would say that. yes. I would say the difference between the hammered variety and the axed variety is I think the axe is a concession to dealing with people who aren't necessarily wearing armor. Because against people who are wearing brigandine, male, Paddy Gamberson, Jacks, whatever, I think this is what you use on them. I think there is a logic <laughs> to that, but does, does it... Uh, I, I don't really care what you're wearing. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it's, it, it's going to be nasty. Oh no, he's not but, wearing plate. But what, I just what, think, what like, I <laughs> if I if I was going to get hit in the thigh by any of these things here, fully sharpened up, the axe blade is probably I, what I'd least yeah, like to be hit I, in the thigh. There's, with. there's maybe some, uh, I don't know, some <laughs> personal choice involved, there, isn't it? I, I, also, the English. We know, um, although the English had this type as well, the English and Burgundians. Uh, well, actually, that, the Lazou de la Hache, which is Burgundian, suggests they like the hammer type, but English sources often show this type so in England it seems they really liked an axe blade and this could be a tradition we know even uh, two-handed axes were popular even in the 13th and 14th century the Hastings brass shows uh, one of um, one of his mates leaning on a two-handed it looks like a Danax it looks exactly like a Danax and then of course we going all the way back to Hastings mm. we know the Danax was popular so it could be there was a sort of living tradition popularity for two-handed axes in you've in got, England you know, but you've got your langets and even this you've got your rondel to protect your hands um, yours has got a, a sort of a more standard a foot a shoe, foot, a shoe yeah heel feral um, and I've got a Blooming great spike! <laughs> I've got the nasty spike. Yeah, it's a hollow so ground hollow ground triangle. triangular. I mean, that is going to punch through mail, isn't it? It's um, not a nice place to be. <laughs> Impaled on the end of a pole axe. <laughs> so, uh, briefly, just tell us about this because this wasn't bought as you now see it. Oh no. These are actually from the same. Uh, maker. They are from the same maker. I think it's Casto Armory or something like that. Yeah. And I like the base model, but I wasn't particularly. I wasn't sure it was actually ash that they'd used in the hilt. No. And it did just. This this wood does not seem of the best quality. It is not. So <laughs> I was like, I must change it for actually like proper material, and it kind of spiraled from there. So I ended up <laughs> refinishing it all by hand, resharpening everything. I short polished it. Yeah, polished it. Customized the langets. Made custom little hand filed bronze rivets for it. Uh, blackened this. Um, all of this I shaped. This is all shaped nice. by hand again, hand sanding. And the the actual bottom spike for this was ordered as a custom piece and added later. From them. From um, I contacted Castor, and I think they have a blacksmith they work with because okay. obviously they were able to give him the, the correct socket oh, dimensions. Right. He did the work and sent it back. So, um, yeah, I, I just ended up completely tearing it apart. But it looks fantastic. It. You can see, you can see in essence that they're from the same maker, but your finish is so much better. It looks like a custom made piece now. And I have to say, so I have, um, been somewhat uh, forceful with this, hitting various objects to check out whether it was strong enough to send up to it, and it, it is. Uh, but one thing is I've now got a very slight, in fact, I can't feel it now, but there's a very slight wiggle to my ax head on the shaft because the shaft goes inside the head. Your shaft is um, probably much better quality wood and less likely to that get will probably compressed. Help with that so, to some yeah. so obviously, when that goes, mm. you can replace it with a nice bit of English ash. Well, I'm now thinking I might actually do a custom job on this, like you've done on yours, and I'll sharpen this up. And it's and... a good fun project. It's <laughs> um, it's quite a lot of work. Yeah, that's to, a... to just sort of disassemble it, yeah. reassemble it, refinish it. But you know, um, it's what you can do with stuff like off the peg items. You don't always have to put up with it mm. exactly how it comes from the manufacturer. You, if you're willing to, yeah, to risk completely binning it off, you can, you can, you know, things can be done. 
Um, and that's, that's total custom. So bringing now. it back to Fury for a second. So Fury's um, pole hammer, if you want to call it that, but he calls it Atcha, um, pole axe, essentially is like this setup. It has a hammer, it has a beak, it has a dag, and it has a bottom spike in some of the pictures uh, and not in others. His looks a little bit shorter than that, it I would does. say. Um, so Fury, of all the pole axe sources we've got, Fury is the earliest and it also seems to show a shorter weapon than all of the other Polax sources. So his Polax looks like it only comes up to about there. It's almost like a two-handed warhammer. I, I have actually thought about shortening this yeah. further, yeah. but I, I was it's trying nice, that to length, balance though. the length, yeah. Um, and I kind of just felt that, you know, sort of head... Mm. I don't know, it just it, it seemed right at the time. It just does, it changes slightly how it's shown held. So, for example, if we look at uh, Le Jus de la Hache, very often they hold the cue or the tail far out in front like that, whereas Fiore it seems to hold the polax quite far down, like a, almost like a two-handed sword, doesn't mm, he, quite a yeah. lot of the time, which is a bit unwieldy with one this long, but if you made it shorter, if it was only that long, well, yeah, now it feels like a Danax. So I actually think that Fiori's polax is not very typical method of polax use at all, actually. If we look at the later 15th century and 16th century polax stuff, it's used more like a pole arm, whereas Fiori's is, seems to almost be used more like a big heavy two-handed sword not a pole arm but a yeah pole arm. Uh, yeah exactly <laughs> but um yeah yeah and uh, like you know uh victor corban no i no they're lovely weapons though they're, aren't I they do like just, them. i mean is... everyone goes on about swords but honestly if you spend any amount of time in armor or just playing with medieval weapons in general i love a pole axe they're so nice <laughs> they're just lovely things and they're so just kind of in many ways, needlessly elaborate as well. They're very, elaborate. They're they're very specialised. They're weird. They are weird, you know, <laughs> but they're interestingly, weird, dangerously weird. <laughs> they're great things. Anyway, so there's Fury's main pole arms. He has some other weird and wonderful weapons, which maybe we'll look at in the future. But fundamentally, you've got the normal spear, or actually the short spear, as he calls it. Um, you've got the winged spear, and you've got the pole axe. So there are Fury's main three pole arms. Uh, Matt, thanks a lot for joining me for this and for bringing your toys down no so that we worries. can all look at. And thanks a lot for watching. Check out the links below. Um, I'll put links to Matt's stuff and also check all the other links under there. Please give this video a like. It makes a big difference to the channel. And if you're not subscribed, why not do so? Um, we'll see you really soon. Cheers, folks.